Some people, like the Andaman Islanders, that's a community living in the Gulf of Bengal, see them as burning torches thrown into the air by forest spirits. Others, like some Australian Aborigines, think they're flaming sticks ridden by shamans. If you ask an astronomer, though, they'll tell you that a comet is a large object made of dust and ice that orbits the sun. Arguably one of the most famous space objects of this kind is Halley's Comet. It has left a great impact on our history and understanding of these mysterious falling stars. When this comet passed Earth in August of 1835, for example, it was blamed for the New York City fire that kept going for several nights. At the same time, the Seminole Indians in Florida saw the comet's long tail and believed it marked the day they would lose their independence. This comet came back in 1910, and people yet again saw it as a sign of bad luck. In Chicago, people bent over backward to secure their windows to protect themselves from the comet's dangerous tail. Others bought all sorts of gadgets, like umbrellas or masks protecting from comets. But what's so intriguing about this space body? How come it just pops up around Earth every once in a while? And most importantly, is it really dangerous? Halley's is what astronomers call a periodic comet. It visits us every 75 years or so. On rare occasions, some lucky people get to see it twice in their lifetime. It last passed Earth in 1986, and it is expected to come back in 2061. Despite this scheduled return, the comet's orbit can't be predicted with precision. That's partly because of the chemical processes happening inside the comet. Halley's orbit may also change due to random interactions with other planets and space objects in our solar system. Its official title is 1P slash Halley, and it's named after English astronomer Edmund Halley. He was the one who studied the reports of a comet nearing Earth in 1531, 1607, and 1682. Based on his calculations, he concluded that these three occurrences had been, in fact, the same comet, returning over and over again. He also predicted its return in 1758. Halley's discovery also pointed out that some comets, like this one, orbited the sun, but their journey was not circular. If you look at it in 2D, Halley's orbit looks like an elliptical wire dangling from the sun. Sadly, Halley didn't live to see the comet's correctly predicted return, but it was named after him. According to the European Space Agency, the first sighting of Halley's Comet dates back to March 30th, 239 BCE. Asian astronomers noted it down in the She Qi and Wenxian Thung Kao chronicles. But another study claims that we might have first noticed it even earlier than that, during the times of the ancient Greeks. Writings from that period reported a huge meteor that landed in northern Greece, leaving the local population perplexed. It soon became one of the ancient world's most popular tourist attractions. But the authors also noticed a comet in the sky at the time the meteor landed. They also reported the fact that the unusual space object had remained in the sky for about 75 days. Shakespeare himself seems to have written about this comet in his play Julius Caesar around the year 1600. In this work, he included a now famous phrase speaking of comets as unusual signs, saying, the heavens themselves blaze forth. It wasn't the last time famous writers felt a certain connection with this object. Writer Mark Twain even said in 1909, I came in with Halley's Comet in 1835. It is coming again next year, and I expect to go out with it. Surprisingly, Twain passed away on April 21st, 1910, one day after Halley's had emerged from behind the far side of the sun. We got a better look at the comet when it last passed us in 1986. Several spacecraft were sent toward Halley's to take samples of the comet's composition. This fleet of spaceships, dubbed the Halley Armada, flew nearby one of them taking several pictures of the comet's core for the first time in history. We also had much better telescopes to look at the comet as it swung by our planet this time. Based on current studies, there's little to no chance that Halley's Comet could actually pose any danger to our planet. 
most of the bad things associated with the comet were just fabrications. Even better, comets, in general, may have made life on Earth possible. Specialists believe that early in our planet's history, collisions with comets brought a significant amount of water here, which helped to form our oceans. These space objects may have also gifted us organic material necessary for the formation of life. Don't confuse comets with asteroids, though. Unlike asteroids, which are small rocky space bodies also orbiting the sun, comets are mostly made up of frozen ammonia, methane, or water. They contain only small amounts of rocky material. Because of their composition, comets are sometimes nicknamed dirty snowballs. Comets are made of four parts, a nucleus, a coma, a dust tail, and an ion tail but their nucleus makes up most of their total mass. There are over 3,000 comets that we know of, but astronomers think there may be up to 1 billion of them in our solar system. A comet that is bright enough to be visible from Earth without the help of a telescope is called a great comet. Approximately one great comet can be seen every 10 years or so. People have noticed other comets for millennia. However, Scientists have concluded that since comets shed a lot of material each time they orbit close to the sun, their lifespan may be only thousands of years. If you compare that to the age of the solar system, which is 4.6 billion years, it's a relatively small number. Since these space bodies are still present in the solar system today, there must be a source of comets somewhere out there. Otherwise, all comets would have disappeared a long time ago. Another famous comet is named Hale-Bopp. It came very close to Earth in January 1997. The last time it was seen near our planet before that was during the Bronze Age, back in 2000 BCE. This comet is much larger and more spectacular than Halley's. Its nucleus stretches for up to 24 miles in diameter and can be seen from the surface of our planet with the unaided eye. Comet Borelli was the second comet to be studied up close by a spacecraft. NASA's Deep Space One approached it in 2001 and gave scientists a detailed report of the comet's black core. This comet is surprisingly lopsided, but the reason for its unusual shape is still up for debate. Halley's comet appears to have formed in the Oort cloud at the outer edges of the solar system. But Borelli is said to come from an icy cloud of rocks beyond Neptune which is called the Kuiper Belt. Comet Hyakutake gave us quite the show when it passed just 9.3 million miles from Earth in March 1996. It looked like an ice blue splash with a faint gas tail. This comet amazed astronomers too, as it produced X-rays 100 times more intense than scientists had predicted. A spaceship called Ulysses passed through Hyakutake's tail in May 1996 reporting that it was at least 350 million miles long. That's double the size of any other known comet's tail. The comet Wild 2 was examined by NASA's Stardust spacecraft back in 2004. The probe managed to fly within 147 miles of the nucleus of Wild 2, giving us some of the best comet pictures to date. It was also the first time we got samples of dust particles from a comet. The precious cargo came back to Earth in January 2006. Its aim was to shed light on the conditions under which Wild 2, and the solar system for that matter, formed those billions of years ago. Wild 2 is about three miles in diameter and covered with craters and cliffs. Okay, here you are in the middle of the ocean. It's endless, but you can't see it because there's a thick fog all around you. Dense clouds hide the huge but dim sun. Is it day or night? You don't know. There's only a gray haze around you. You're alone. Even if you try to swim down, after several hours, you still won't be able to see the bottom of the ocean. And that's a typical water planet for you. I know, sounded kind of dark, but it's not that bad. These water worlds are more interesting than they may seem, so let's take a look at them. The ocean planet is a planet that consists, as you might have guessed, mainly of water, ice, and maybe some rocks. Think of the Earth's oceans. Its horrifying depths, the Mariana Trench, and all that. 
And now, can you guess how much space all the water on Earth takes up? 0.025%, exactly. Now, just try to imagine a world of 40-60% to water. If you dive in there, the depth can exceed 60 miles. Compared to that, the 6-mile depth of our Mariana Trench sounds like nothing. And yeah, the pressure there will be enormous. It can reach up to 20,000 Earth atmospheres. Very crushing. Now, it may sound scary, but it still would be great to find out more about these planets. Fortunately, according to scientists' calculations, there may be a lot of such planets in our galaxy alone. Well, you don't have to go far. You can find these water guys even in our solar system. Not planets, of course, but moons. Jupiter has Ganymede and Callisto, and Saturn has Titan and Enceladus. The ocean can reach up to 30% of the mass of these moons. Although it isn't clear whether these oceans are covered with a thick crust of ice. But we've discovered quite a few full-fledged ocean planets. This is because the conditions in which these planets may exist are very specific. For example, this planet should be somewhere 6 to 8 times larger than the Earth. If it's smaller, it'll have a rocky surface. But if it's bigger, it'll turn into a gas giant. At the same time, it must be in the habitable zone of its star. A little further, and the planet immediately turns into an icy giant or a cold super-Earth. So yeah, these guys are very picky. We first started exploring these planets back in the 1970s. However, since then, we found only a couple of them. But they're still very interesting. The first planet is Gliese 1214b. It was the very first ocean planet that we discovered. Initially, the scientists noticed only a small, dim dot. This dot turned out to be the red dwarf star Gliese 1214, an unremarkable, completely ordinary star that's five times smaller than our Sun and 300 times dimmer. Scientists wouldn't worry about it at all, but back in 2009, they noticed that this star had one single planet, and this planet turned out to be quite strange. This super-Earth was 2.5 times bigger than our Earth and 6.5 times heavier, but at the same time, it had a very, very small density and about the same gravity as our planet. In other words, there were almost no rocks and metals on it. But it wasn't a gas giant either. So there was only one option left. It was covered in water and ice. And that's how we discovered the first ocean planet. Well, actually, we can only assume that it consists of water. That's what the mathematical calculations say. In reality, this planet is quite confusing. It's difficult to explore, and so far, scientists haven't been able to find anything there. No hydrogen, no helium, no water, nada. That's because the outer layer of the atmosphere of this planet is very dense, and it perfectly hides its composition. But even so, it's probably a water world. Gliese 1214b is very close to its star. It's only 0.014 astronomical units away, which is less than the distance between the Moon and us. The year there lasts about 36 hours, and the temperatures, to put it mildly, are just wild. Scientists suggest that the average temperature there can reach 250 to 535 degrees Fahrenheit. Woo, that's hot! Remember the creepy description from the beginning? Well, actually, spending time on Gliese 1214b would be a little different. More like swimming in a steam boiler. Because of such gigantic temperatures, the ocean on the surface will be constantly in a state close to boiling without actually reaching it. So, imagine that you're descending to the surface of this planet, flying through clouds of steam. And then, you suddenly find yourself in the water. What? But when did it happen? Well, that's because the boundary between steam and water on Gliese 1214b will be very blurred. Of course, you won't be able to swim to the bottom of this ocean. But most likely, this bottom is covered with a very thick layer of so-called hot ice. It's like regular ice, but it doesn't really care about the laws of physics, so it just doesn't melt even at gigantic temperatures. And the thickness of this ice can reach as much as 3,000 miles. So that's it for the creepy Gliese 1214b. And not an Airbnb in sight! Now, although we can't 100% guarantee that it's a water world, we still have another candidate for this position. A newly discovered planet called TOI 1452b. This planet, located in the Dragon constellation, is almost 100 light-years away from us. 
It was discovered using the TESS telescope by a group of researchers from the University of Montreal. This planet also belongs to the class of super-Earths. It's seven times larger than our planet, but 48 times heavier. Again, all this is at a very low density. Because of this, scientists have suggested that almost the entire planet consists of a giant ocean. Here, we were a little luckier. This world won't be just a giant puddle and some thick ice. On this planet, there's probably a rocky surface deep under the water, just like in a typical ocean. Don't get too excited, though. This ocean will certainly be very different from what we're used to. TOI 1452b also orbits a small red dwarf. And not even one, but two at once. At the same time, if the previous planet was close to its sun, then this one, on the contrary, is very, very far away. It's two and a half times farther from its stars than Pluto is from the sun. And it moves at great speed. A year there lasts only 11 days. But we still don't know many things about this planet. We'll probably get some new information when scientists observe it from the James Webb Telescope. Well, that's it. Wait, did you expect something else? All right, all right, I know the question that bothers you the most. Can there be life? Well, this is a difficult question. We all know that water means life, and besides, these planets are in the habitable zones of their stars. So, potentially, yes, there might be life. Not some full-fledged civilizations, of course, but bacteria, fish, and some creepy giant monsters. I mean, you know, why not? However, this is very unlikely. Water alone isn't enough to create life, even though it's very important. There should also be some microelements and some minerals. And unfortunately, for most water planets, the composition will only consist of water and very thick ice. There won't be any minerals there. But don't give up there's still some probability. First of all, there are meteorites and comets. They can bring the necessary minerals to the planet. The more often they crash into it, the higher the probability that they'll bring something like this into the ocean and thus create life. Secondly, TOI 1452b actually has these minerals. Yes, we don't know how deep the rocky bottom is located there. But if it exists, then surely something could have originated there. Let's hope that new research with powerful telescopes will allow us to find out the truth. And who knows? Maybe one day we'll be able to visit such a planet ourselves. Now, Mercury is the planet that's usually closest to Earth. Does that surprise you? Did me. Venus certainly gets closer to us than Mercury. It can be as close as 25 million miles. After all, Venus is the second planet from the Sun, and Earth is the third. Even Mars gets closer to Earth than Mercury. The red planet can come as close to our home as 35 million miles, as it will in the year 2287. <laughs> I won't be around for that. The average distance from Earth to Mercury is 48 million miles. But Mercury is still usually the closest planet to Earth. That's because Venus is usually somewhere on the other side of the Sun for 112 days. And Mars is usually far away in its highly elliptical, almost two-year-long orbit. That leaves Mercury zipping between the Earth and the Sun every 44 days, and thus usually closer to Earth than either Venus or Mars. Hey, good trivia question to pull on your friends, isn't it? 22 spacecraft have successfully flown to Venus, and over 30 spacecraft have flown to Mars. But only two have ever gone to Mercury. So, what's so hard about going there? Well, it has to do with the Sun. Mercury is not only the planet that is usually closest to Earth, it is also the planet that is always closest to the Sun. 28.6 million miles close, to be precise. Being that close to the Sun creates navigational challenges, to put it mildly. Any spacecraft going to Mercury gets accelerated by the tremendous gravitational pull of the Sun. The spacecraft will be moving too fast to go into orbit around Mercury. That's why the first spacecraft that went to Mercury, the USA's Mariner 10, merely flew by Mercury three times, but made no attempt to achieve orbit around Mercury. The only other ship to go to Mercury, the USA's Messenger spacecraft, took six and a half years to get there. Now that's a trip! 
Messenger did achieve orbit for a period of four years before finally running out of fuel and crashing onto the surface of Mercury on April 20th, 2015. Many other spacecraft have flown to Jupiter in about the same time or less than it took Messenger to go to Mercury. The hang-up is the deceleration of the spacecraft. Quite simply, it takes too much onboard fuel supply to fire the engines in the reverse direction and break the speed of the ship against the sun's great gravity. Slowing down sufficiently to get into orbit around Mercury is a no-go using rocket power. Some other way had to be found to slow Messenger down, a way that didn't use much or any fuel. Messenger was a hefty 2,400 pounds or so, loaded with nine pieces of -of state-of-the-art scientific equipment. Now, 55% of the total weight, or about 1,300 pounds, was fuel. But this fuel would not be used to slow the spacecraft down. The fuel would be used for five engine burns associated with gravity assists and also for orbital adjustments once Messenger got to Mercury. Now, gravity assists uses the gravity of a planet and the planet's orbital velocity to either speed up or slow down a spacecraft. If the ship approaches a planet at a forward-moving angle, that is, an angle in the direction the planet is revolving around the Sun, then both the planet's gravity and the orbital velocity of the planet give the spacecraft a slingshot boost, greatly increasing the speed of the craft and sending it off in a different direction. This boost in speed can be added to by the spacecraft firing its rocket engines at just the right time. Both of America's Voyager probes used Jupiter's massive gravity to slingshot them to the outer gas giant planets and eventually out of the solar system. Gravity assist can also be used to slow down a spacecraft, as in the case of Messenger. By entering a planet's orbital path ahead of the planet, the planet's gravity pulls back on the spacecraft and slows it down. An engine burn is necessary at this time to escape the orbital path of the planet. Messenger performed one gravity assist flyby of Earth, two gravity assist flybys of Venus, and three gravity flybys of Mercury. Only then had Messenger been slowed enough to enter into orbit around Mercury. The probe traveled an astounding 5 billion miles to get to Mercury from Earth. That's farther than Pluto is away from Earth at its most distant. The name Messenger is an acronym, almost as clever as its intricate flight path to Mercury. Because Mercury is the fastest-moving planet, the ancient Greeks appointed Mercury as the Messenger of Olympus. News traveled fast even back then. Messenger really stands for Mercury Surface, Space Environment, Geochemistry, and Ranging. Hmm, what do you think? Did they have a contest to come up with that? Now, the good news is, there's another mission to Mercury underway right now. It is a combined ESA-JAXA space mission that is bringing two orbiting satellites to Mercury. The mission doesn't use an acronym for its spacecraft. It has a real name, Bepi Colombo. No, it's not a cartoon character. Dr. Giuseppe Colombo, after whom the spacecraft is named, was an Italian mathematician and professor of applied mechanics. He worked with NASA on the Mariner 10 mission to Mercury. Beppe is Giuseppe's childhood nickname, which everyone knew and loved him by. NASA had been content with one flyby of Mercury, the first ever. But Professor Beppe calculated that with a slight adjustment of the flight path to enable a gravity assist at Venus, Mariner 10 could fly by Mercury again and again on different orbits around the Sun. Thanks to Beppe, NASA got three flybys of Mercury for the price of one. Bebe Colombo, the spacecraft, is scheduled to perform nine gravity assist flybys. One at Earth, two at Venus, and six at Mercury itself. Each planetary deceleration slows Bebe Colombo relative to the speed Mercury is moving around the Sun. This will allow for orbital insertion. Otherwise, Bebe Colombo would head off into the Sun. Now, once in orbit around Mercury, BepiColombo's Mercury Transfer Module, or MTM for short, will release two satellites, one European, the MPO, Mercury Planetary Orbiter, and one Japanese, the MEO, Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter. Both are expected to orbit Mercury for one year. Altogether, the MCS, Mercury Composite Spacecraft, 
consists of the MPO, the MEO, the MTM, and MOSIF, which protects the spacecraft from the sun and houses the electronics for MEO. This alphabet soup of mission components highlights the other reason it is difficult to get to Mercury. After six gravity assist slowdowns, six engine burns, 18 orbits around the sun, six and a half years of travel time, and nine billion miles of distance, you have to bring a tailored complex of equipment. It's like that mountain picnic you'd like to go on. You can't just drive there. You have to hike a long way up a tricky mountain trail and bring along insect repellent, sunscreen, and your hat. Oh, and lunch and beverages. It's not easy. Bippo Colombo has packed it all, including lunch. Nah, not really. The design is incredibly complex. Nothing can face the sun, not even the solar panels. The solar panels must be kept turned almost to a right angle to the sun, or the heat and particle flux will corrode the solar cells. And without electricity, you have nothing. Therefore, at right angles to the sun, the solar panels must be extra long, as if there were only a little bit of sunshine. Bepi's solar panels are 50 feet long. The sun shield must remain gyroscopically aligned towards the sun so that all instruments are always in the shade but still have a line of sight to what each is meant to monitor. And there are a lot of instruments. Five in the JAXA orbiter and 11 in the ESA orbiter. It's one amazing picnic. Anyway, the science objectives are meant to add to what we have learned from the previous two missions to Mercury. The data collected by Bepi Colombo will enable scientists to study the planet's interior and composition, along with Mercury's geology and surface morphology, Mercury's magnetic fields formation and evolutionary history, the planet's solar wind interactions, and overall environment. As a metal-rich planet, Mercury may hold a vast wealth of minerals that Messenger failed to detect. Bepi Colombo launched in October 2018 and still has a long way to go before it goes into orbit around Mercury. However, Bepi has already flown past Mercury and returned new photographs. The European Space Agency is excited about its first hot mission. All of the S's previous missions have been cold missions to objects further out into space, such as Mars, the asteroid belt, comet rendezvous, and elsewhere far out in the solar system. Well, all I can say is, best wishes to Bepi Colombo. Let's hope all goes well on its 800 degrees Fahrenheit mission to Mercury. Let's hope that Mercury's long tail of exosphere gases, sodium, magnesium, and potassium, blown off the planet's surface by the solar wind, don't fog up the lenses or coat the solar panels. Have a nice time! Ciao, baby!